I started off with what I considered leadership building blocks one, two, and three from my life, from the SEAL teams, when I got to the SEAL teams. My first three SEAL platoons, this is the 1990s, there's no war going on, and I looked at these situations and said, okay, these are things that I took from these specific events or these specific scenarios and I applied those for the rest of my career and for the rest of my life and I apply them today. And so what I did was I started off by telling these three stories about my first platoon, my second platoon, my third platoon. My first platoon, to summarize the story, we were doing a training operation, we get into this tactical situation, everyone in my platoon is focused on one area. Everyone's looking down their weapons, waiting for a threat to expose itself which means you got 16 guys looking down their weapons and I'm waiting for someone to make a call. I was a new guy. I'm waiting for someone above me in the chain of command to say, hey, move here or hey, move forward or, or make some kind of a decision. And as I'm waiting, no one's doing it. So, I, so I'm a new guy. I'm scared to say anything and I know I shouldn't say anything, so I'm just waiting and no one's giving an order. No one's giving any direction. So I wait longer. And this goes on for probably 30 seconds or a minute, which is a really long time when you're trying to take down a target. And finally I said to myself, all right, I'm gonna see what's going on. So I actually point my weapon at the ceiling and I take a step back and I just look around. And, and I see that every single person in my platoon, including my platoon commander, including the assistant platoon commander, including the platoon leading petty officer, everyone is just focused on their weapons and no one's making a decision. And I can see this. And because I'm looking around, and I'm detached from the scenario just by, just by eight inches I stepped back. Stepped back and looked around. I can see what decision needs to be made. And so I, I summoned up as much courage as I could as a new guy, because new guys don't make decisions. And I said, hold left, clear right, which was a basic command that we had rehearsed and you would practice. And I expected someone to say, you know, shut up, <laughs> shut up Jocko. But instead they repeated the command. They all said, hold left, clear right, which means we were gonna execute it. And sure enough, the guys on the left held and the guys on the right cleared and we, we got done. And instead of someone saying, hey, you need to keep your mouth shut, like one of the more senior guys said, hey, good job up there, way to make a call. So I looked at it and I said, wait a second, how could I have, a, as a new guy, have made a decision in that situation that was better than what the more senior, more experienced guys were making? And I realized it was because I took a step back and detached from it. So at that moment, I said to myself, okay, from now on, when I get into these tactical scenarios, I'm gonna take a step back and I'm gonna try and look around and I'm gonna try and detach myself from the chaos and the mayhem. And I started doing it all the time. In every tactical situation, in the land warfare, in the mountains, in the urban environments, I was doing it all the time. And I was able to like see what was happening. It was like a superpower to be able to see what was happening and make decisions. And so then I actually started doing it when I was having conversations. And if you and I were in disagreement and you started getting emotional, instead of me getting emotional back at you, I would just take a step back and be like, oh, okay, he's really, he's really concerned about this. Why is he so concerned? What does he see that I don't see? And I started actually just detaching all the time. And that became a very powerful tool in leadership that I use to this day. My second platoon, we have a a great platoon chief, we have a great platoon LPO, we have a great assistant platoon commander, but our platoon commander, the guy actually in charge of the whole platoon, he's not very experienced. He had come from a different job in the Navy, so he didn't have a lot of experience, and which is fine. Like, it's okay to be inexperienced as a leader. You can get through that. As long as you're humble and you listen and you take advice from other people, you're gonna, you should be able to do fine. No one expects you to know everything as a leader but he didn't do that. He didn't listen. He didn't take advice. He didn't take guidance. Everything was like his way or the highway. And eventually, we in the platoon got kind of fed up with it. And we had a mutiny inside of our platoon. We went to our commanding officer and said, hey, sir, we don't want to work for our platoon commander. He, he doesn't listen, he's arrogant. And eventually what ended up happening was this guy got fired as our platoon commander. And that left an impact on me because as I'm watching this going, I'm thinking to myself, why don't we like this guy? Why doesn't anyone want to listen to this guy? Why don't we want to follow this guy? And the reason, because he was arrogant and he didn't listen and he didn't give us any ownership of everything. Everything was about him. And that would, that would have made an impression on me. That, that would have left a mark. But the mark got left even more clearly because when that guy got fired, the guy that came in and took over for him was, was like 
I hate to use the word legendary, but he was a pretty legendary SEAL, had a ton of experience, he'd come up through the ranks, and he had been stationed at every different kind of SEAL team, and he took over as our platoon commander. And I kind of thought to myself, well, he's gonna take over because we're a bunch of mutineers, and they need to put someone really strong that's gonna like whip us back into shape. So I was anticipating that we were gonna have this super hardcore guy. And, and this guy shows up, and he's got a nice smile on his face, and he's super humble. And I remember the, one of the first things he said to us was like, I look forward to working with you guys. And I was, it, it, the, the, that word right there, I'm gonna work with you guys. Not, not I'm in charge, I'm glad I'm taking over, I'm glad to be your commander. It was nothing like that. He said, hey, I'm looking forward to working with you guys. So all of a sudden, it was totally different. And he started putting us in charge of things. Instead of him coming up with a plan, he would say, hey, you guys come up with a plan and let me know how you want to do it. And all of a sudden, we had all this ownership and that made me reflect on the way the first guy had acted compared to the way this guy had acted. And I realized how important it was to be a humble leader and to listen to other people and to give ownership to other people. So that was the second platoon. And then in the third platoon, the story that I tell is we were, it was a good solid platoon and we had a good platoon commander and we were out in the desert doing some training and uh, some targets popped up. It's just fake, it's just, it's not war. But we start engaging the targets like we're supposed to and everyone gets in the prone position and is returning fire. And I did what I had been doing this whole time, which was detach. I kind of took a step back, took, shot a couple rounds, then kind of pulled back and looked to see what was going on. And I saw the call that needed to be made. And I gave the platoon commander a couple seconds to make a call and he didn't make it. So, you know, I, call, I made the call, peel left. And everyone said, okay, peel left. And we peeled left and we left the scenario and we got our distance and then we stopped the training exercise and we did a little debrief. And during the debrief, the platoon commander, you know, he said to me, well, why did you make that call? And I said, well, I could see what we needed to do, you know, and you hadn't made a call, so I, I you know, I, I made the call. And he goes, well, I actually didn't want to peel left. I wanted to assault the target. And, and, and right there in that split second, I kind of thought to myself, well, like part of my ego flared up and I was kind of thinking, I, I could have said something along the lines of, well, you need to make a call faster. If you're not going to step up and lead, then I'm going to do it. Like I could have said that. But I realized at that moment in time, wait a second, I didn't need to make a call. The, the problem could have developed more. But for some reason, I thought that I needed to be the guy. And I said, no, you know what? You don't need to be the guy. You're a leader. You need to support your leader. And it's not about you. And so that right there also changed my attitude because then from then on in my career and in my life, I realized, hey, I don't always need to be the center of attention, which is what our ego wants us to do. Our ego always wants it to be about us. And it's not about us. It's not about us at all. In fact, in a situation like that, where the platoon commander wants to do something, maybe he sees something that I don't see. Maybe he's got a different strategic objective that he wants to accomplish and I'm undermining that. And what does that do to our platoon? Hey, it makes me feel great, because I think, oh yeah, I might not be the guy in charge, but I'm out here making the calls. That's your ego. And what you have to do is subordinate your ego and be supportive of the person that's in charge, and you move forward together as a team, because that's what it's about. It's not about me, it's about the team.